Thanks. All right. So this will provide a brief introduction to the roofline model. It's not designed to be an exhaustive uh, survey of all the kind of roofline research that's happened over the last uh, 12, 13 years. Uh, but we'll give you a basic introduction to what the model is and uh, in general how one might apply it in the abstract. So a few acknowledgments. Start out with a motivating question. So let's say you just spent the last six months porting your application to GPUs. The question becomes, are you done? Is it worth it? Did you actually make good use of your resources? And to answer that question, you need to get at the question of what is good performance? That is, if you're getting good performance on the GPU, you're probably done and you should move on to uh, other activities in order to, to further your research. So let's imagine that you took your application and you profiled the mix of loop nests within your application running on the GPU. And for some arbitrary ordering of loop nest, you get these completely random different flop rates for different loops. That is, some of them perform uh, at, at very high flop rates, some of them get very, very low flop rates. Uh, that means that the flop rate alone is not particularly insightful. It didn't really tell you, are you getting good performance? Because some of them are fast, some of them are slow. Second, you could think about, let's just take your uh, existing code uh, and run it on a Xeon or an AMD Epic and see what kind of baseline performance you get. You could then use that baseline performance and compare to the GPU performance and conclude whether you're getting good performance. The problem is, is that that really just tells you relative speed up. That is, some kernels uh, got enormous speed ups, that it was dramatically orders of magnitude faster on the GPU than it was on the CPU. But then there are other kernels like this one for which the performance speedup may have been actually very, very modest and only a, a slight increase in performance. So to get to this, this core question of what is good performance, we need to answer two fund or address uh, two fundamental aspects of what is good performance. That is, first, to attain good performance, you have to be operating your GPU in the throughput limited regime. That is, you are not sensitive to Omdahl effects. That is, you're not having a, a sequential bottleneck slow down your code. Uh, you don't have the device to host, host to device transfers impeding your performance. That is, you're, you're running with data primarily once it's actually on the device and spending most of your time running with data on the device. And third, your launch overheads are, are relatively small. That is, you're not launching a bunch of little uh, microsecond kernels uh, and spending multiple additional microseconds just launching the kernels. You want to be running long millisecond, one second uh, kernels in order to amortize that overhead. The second aspect of good performance is that you want to be making good use of the GPU's compute and or bandwidth capabilities. That is, GPU has uh, tens of teraflops of, of performance of compute and a ballpark terabyte per second of bandwidth. You want to make sure that you're using one or both of those. To, to their fullest extent. Ultimately, what we really need is this quantitative model rather than these qualitative or relative statements. That is, we don't want to just say, okay, it's kind of good. We want to be able to say we're getting 90% of our theoretical limit. Or we don't want to be able to just say we're twice as fast as the Xeon. We want to be saying we're making 80%, we're attaining 80% of our GPU's compute capability or our, its bandwidth capability. So the roofline model is really geared to be a throughput oriented performance model. It's going to track rates, not time. So when you do roofline analysis, it ends up being a prediction of a flop rate or instruction per second rate rather than a prediction of runtime. Ultimately, the way the model is constructed, it's basically independent of the instruction set architecture. So it doesn't matter whether it's a RISC or a CISC architecture, it doesn't matter if it's x86 or power. Uh, and it's also implement in, uh, independent of the underlying architecture. This means it's applicable to a CPU or a GPU or even a Google TPU. Uh, more recently, we've looked at how we might apply it to FPGAs or other reconfigurable architectures. And it helps us transform this, this kind of abstract good performance into a quantitative statement of actual performance. So let's imagine, just to begin with, that we are running on some kind of uh, superscalar Xeon. Well, in this particular case, we have a, a Skylake Xeon. If just looking at the single core architectural diagram, it's incredibly complex. That is, uh, we 
the, the number of stages, the number of operations in flight and the complexity of this, this architecture makes it very hard for any individual to contemplate how this will respond to different code. So one option would be to try to just run a, uh, build a simulator for this Skylake CPU and then run our code through this simulator to try to make a prediction of what the performance would be. But that doesn't really give us insight as to what the bottlenecks are in performance. It only really tells us how does performance respond to slight changes in architecture. So it doesn't really give us that, that high level intuition. Worse, simulation is incredibly slow. It's gonna be orders of magnitude slower than simply uh, running the code itself. What we really want are performance models that are orders of magnitude faster than just running the code by itself. So what we wanna do is we wanna take this incredibly complex view of a processor architecture and simplify it down into a very, very simple uh, model of what these cores look like. So we might take this, this kind of high level view and make the assumption that uh, the individual cores in this machine can attain peak flops if they operate on local data. That is, if the data is local and cache, you always get peak flops. Uh, you might assume that all the cores are load balanced running a single program multiple data code. That means that you don't have any kind of Omdahl effects, you don't have any kind of load imbalance effects. They're all the cores are doing the same thing and thus you can collapse them down into one uh, set of compute capability. You might make assumptions like there's sufficient cache bandwidth and cache capacity such that uh, cache capacity misses aren't really affecting performance. The only real effect on performance you have is how fast you can do compute and how fast you can move data on and off chip. So this kind of high level model is really the basis for what we would call the DRAM roofline model. So in this case, all we're really thinking about is data movement to and from DRAM and compute. So in that vein, the model is basically premised on answering the question, which is gonna take longer? Does it take longer to move data on and off chip? Or does it take longer to do the computation once the data is actually on chip? So we can write a simple equation that says, here's kind of what we expect for a runtime. That is the runtime should be the maximum, assuming perfect overlap, of the number of floating point operations in our loop nest, divided by the peak flop rate of our machine, and the number of bytes that have to be moved on and off the chip and the peak bandwidth of the machine. Now, as I mentioned, this assumes perfect overlap of these two. If you don't have perfect overlap, then you have to sum these two. But for the basis of uh, the roofline model in this example, we will always assume perfect overlap of communication and computation. Now, to transform this into what's nominally a roofline model, we need to think about rates. So if we take the original equation and just divide both sides by the number of floating point operations in our code, we can uh, transform the equation into this. And if we reciprocate it one more time, uh, we actually get a slightly different equation. That is the flop rate is going to be the minimum of either the peak gigaflops of the machine or the product of what we call arithmetic intensity and peak bandwidth. Now, this equation is the core equation for roofline. It's the most basic equation in roofline, but it's also the most universal. But buried in this equation is an incredibly important term that I alluded to, this arithmetic intensity. This is the ratio of the number of floating point operations to the number of bytes uh, in your loop nest. So in essence, this arithmetic intensity is a measure of data locality. It's how much data reuse each of your loop nests actually have. That is, it is that ratio of the total number of floating point operations performed in that loop nest divided by the total number of bytes moved on and off the chip for that loop nest. So for the deep, uh, DRAM roofline model, this is total bytes to and from DRAM. And that means it includes all, all the cache, all the prefetcher effects, any kind of speculation effects, any kind of data that moves on and off chip has to be included in the denominator of arithmetic intensity. That means that it can be very different from the total number of loads and stores in your loop nest. That is a load and store is just a request to the memory subsystem to bring data into a register. But the cache hierarchy is right there to filter all of those loads and stores and distill them down only to a compulsory set that actually have to go to DRAM. So one other way of viewing this, rather than just viewing it as the total number of flops divided by the total number of bytes, 
is a ratio of sustained flop rate to sustained bandwidth. Basically, in that case, time will, will cancel out in both terms. So you can view it as in either form. For most cases, we will view it as the ratio of the number of floating point operations divided by the number of bytes and construct uh, performance instrumentation technologies geared to measure those two terms. So let's think about how we go about visualizing this. So if we take this basic equation, this minimum of flop rates and the product of AI and peak bandwidth, we can plot this as a roofline bound using arithmetic intensity as the x-axis. Um, for a number of historical reasons, uh, we always plot it on a log-log scale. Um, for one, this makes it incredibly easy to doodle on a whiteboard, to, to brainstorm, uh, to think about how you might have orders of magnitude different bandwidths, uh, or alternately how Moore's law has allowed you to have orders of magnitude faster uh, CPUs and GPUs over the years. That is, those orders of magnitude become linear steps, and thus data does not get squashed into the origin, but you see it well separated. So in this case, the vertical axis is the attainable flop rate for our loop nest. The y-axis is going to be the arithmetic intensity. One of the terms in this equation is the peak flop rate of the machine. The other term in this equation is the product of arithmetic intensity and peak bandwidth. The model itself imposes a minimum function on these two, and thus we end up being constrained to say performance must be on or below this line. Now there's one very important facet in this figure. There is the transition point where you actually transition from being limited by memory bandwidth to being limited by the peak flop rate of the machine. That transition point is the machine balance. That's also an incredibly important uh, term in this in the roofline model. The machine balance is the ratio of the peak flop rate of the machine divided by the peak bandwidth. So in essence, this provides a uh, dual form to what we see with arithmetic intensity. Whereas arithmetic intensity characterizes applications, machine balance characterizes architecture. In both case, cases, they are the ratio of flops to bytes. For applications, it's total flops moved divided by total by, uh, sorry, total flops performed divided by total bytes moved. For machine balance, it's the peak flop rate of your machine divided by the peak bandwidth of your machine. So in essence, the roofline model will tessellate this space, this two-dimensional space of uh, flops and, uh, and AI into five separate regions. Those five regions are important to think about. First of all, we have this region above the dotted pink line. This is unattainable performance. This is faster than the speed of light. You can never actually be have a, a application run in this regime because it's basically saying you are executing com, uh, compute rates faster than what the machine is capable of doing. So we can just off the bat say we can never have a dot up in this region. Second, we have this region here where we are less than the machine balance, less than this, this uh, vertical line, but also greater than the machine bandwidth. That's also unattainable performance. Basically, it says that you don't have bandwidth to actually operate your GPU in this regime. That is, for the amount of data locality you have, you have sufficient compute capability, but you don't have sufficient bandwidth to operate a GPU in this regime. The third regime is the bandwidth bound regime. So in this case, we have uh, we have uh, a low uh, arithmetic intensity, that is our arithmetic intensity is less than the machine balance, but we also are operating less than the memory bandwidth of the machine, maybe within 50% of, of your machine's uh, peak bandwidth. We would describe that as a bandwidth bound regime. You're operating in, in a, and you're actually getting pretty good performance. You're getting 50% of what the roofline can tell you that you can get. Uh, it's not 100%, but you are somewhat constrained by the memory bandwidth of the machine. The fourth regime is this compute limited regime. So in this case, we are right of the machine balance. That is, we have lots of data, uh, data reuse, very high data locality, but uh, we're not actually getting peak flops. We're getting somewhere between 50 and 100% and, uh, of the peak flop rates of the machine. And then finally, we have this regime where we are actually below 50% of bandwidth or below 50% of the compute uh, capability in the machine. And we might describe this as 
poor performance. So in this regime here, this is where we're not actually operating the GPU in what would be considered a good regime. We want to actually make sure our applications get out of this poor performance regime and into either the blue or the pink regions. So let's consider an example. So our typical machine balance today is somewhere between five and 10 floating point operations per byte. Now remember that's floating point operations per byte. And if you want to convert that to floating point operations per double precision word, you need to multiply by eight. That means you're doing somewhere between 40, you have to do somewhere between 40 and 80 floating point operations per double precision word in order to guarantee you are compute limited. That's where the machine balance, the, the machine transitions from being bandwidth limited to being compute limited. Fundamentally, that's an artifact of technology and money and the way applications are driven today, it's very, very unlikely that's gonna dramatically improve in the future. That is, in the future, if you improve bandwidth, you're more than likely going to improve compute by even more. So we can mark this, this transition point at five flops per byte, this, this machine balance. We can then consider a very, very simple vector-vector operation. In this case, we're gonna take two vectors, x and y, scale y by a constant alpha, add it to x, and store it into a, a third vector, z. If we think about this code, uh, we're going to do two floating point operations per iteration. That is, we do an addition and a multiplication on every iteration and we transfer 24 bytes to and from DRAM. That is, we have to read Y, eight bytes, read X, eight bytes, write Z, eight bytes. Eight plus eight plus eight is 24. So if we take that arithmetic intensity of this loop nest, we take the two flops divided by the 24 bytes, and we get 0 0.083 flops per byte. That means that for a vector-vector like operations, this kind of BLOS1 like operation, we are going to be extremely memory limited. That is, we are uh, far, far below the uh, machine balance of this machine, which means that fundamentally, uh, these operations are memory bandwidth limited and they will perform at a very, very low flop rate. Now, let's consider a more complicated example that has some degree of reuse. So in this case, we took some kind of uh, 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 Laplacian operator. We did a second order discretization of it, producing a seven point constant coefficient stencil. In this case, we're going to uh, basically read from six, uh, seven points in memory, basically a star shaped st uh, stencil, and write to a, a new vector, a new grid uh, in memory. So if we go and look at this, we're going to do seven floating point operations. That is the uh, six additions, the one multiplication by a constant, uh, and we do eight memory references. That is, we read these uh, seven points and we write this other point. So one might think that your AI is 0.11. That is, do, do we really take those seven uh, uh, flops and divide by 64 bytes. Well, that gives us an AI, but the problem is, is that that's not the right AI that we want. That arithmetic intensity is really the arithmetic intensity measured at the L1 level. The thing to remember is that for roofline, for the DRAM roofline, we always want to measure the data moving on and off chip. And the observation here is that a perfect cache hierarchy will filter out all but one read and one write of this operation of this loop nest. That means that in reality, only one of these uh, memory references will actually miss in the cache. The other, uh, the other uh, memory references will all hit in the cache and thus not incur DRAM data movement. So if we actually do the calculation, we actually get a different arithmetic intensity. We get the uh, seven flops uh, divided by uh, I it's, uh, sorry, the seven flops divided by 16 bytes, uh, which gives us the 0.44 flops per byte. That's the ideal arithmetic intensity for this kind of seven point stencil. So if we think back, where was triad? Where, where was our vector vector operation? Well, that's way down here at 0 0.083. If we do a seven point stencil, well, we're gonna have five times the arithmetic intensity, but remember 0.44 is still less, far less than the five flops per byte, which means that we're 
still heavily memory bandwidth bound. We got five times the performance, but we are still memory bandwidth bound. So let's think back to this original motivating question. What is good performance? So if we think back to our loop nests, we have this random assortment of loop nests from our uh, porting exercise of porting our application to a GPU. Initially, it looks like there's no real rhyme or reason to actual performance. However, if we were to so sort our kernels based on their arithmetic intensity and plot them accordingly on the x-axis, we can then uh, compare performance of our individual loop nests to the associated roofline model. We can then highlight which of those kernels actually fall into either the bandwidth bound regime or the compute bound regime, either which kernels are making at least 50% of stream or 50% of peak. And we see that most of them actually fall into that re region. However, there's a few kernels that are actually outside that region. So we can actually observe, first of all, that we can have uh, kernels that have low performance. So, so this kernel down here is very, very low performance. That is the, the Y coordinate of this kernel, the flop rate of this kernel is very low, but we can actually say it's making good use of the GPU because it's actually getting a very high fraction of the memory bandwidth of the GPU. Conversely, we can have kernels that have orders of magnitude higher performance, like this red kernel up here, uh, but it's actually making poor use of the GPU. It's making poor use of the GPU because it's far below the compute bound re uh, regime for the GPU. So we can then uh, focus our performance optimization efforts on trying to address these red kernels and kind of bypass spending, our, uh, spending a bunch of time trying to optimize these green kernels because we can only get slight increases in performance for them. So as a recap uh, for this first section, the roofline model is made of two components. You have the lines, the model itself, the machine model itself, which are all the lines in the roofline model. Those are your bandwidth lines, your 50% of stream, your peak flop rate lines. They also, by definition, define the machine balance, the transition point from where you transition from being bandwidth limited to compute uh, limited. Those lines are gonna be unique to each architecture. So if you run those on a CPU, you'll get one set of lines. If you run those on a Volta, you'll get a different set of lines. If you try to construct a roofline model for an Ampere, you'll get a different set of lines. Uh, but when you're running on this uh, architecture, you choose your architecture, all of your applications uh, on that target architecture will be compared to those same two lines. The other aspect of the roofline model is application characteristics. In this case, these are all the dots. The dots are basically defined by the number of flops that an application performs and the number of bytes that it moves. That is the x-axis is the ratio, the x-coordinate is the ratio of those two and the y-coordinate is the uh, ratio of flops and runtime. This means each dot is uh, unique uh, to a loop nest. That is this loop nest is different than this loop nest. Uh, but it also has the subtle meaning that if you were to run this same set of, of loop nests on a different architecture, the dots may move slightly. That is, if the number of bytes uh, that uh, actually have to be moved based on how the cache performs change, then the dots uh, x-axis will actually change. So let's think about what the general performance strategy is for using roofline. Well, uh, first of all, if you're... Uh, uh, far below the uh, peak flop rate of the machine, that is you're in the compute limited regime like this red dot, but you are far less than the 50% of peak, your real goal is to try to improve the performance of that individual loop nest. That's, that's kind of obvious, right? You want those uh, loop nests to actually run faster. But there is a subtlety. That is, when you're actually in the bandwidth limited regime, that doesn't quite mean that you're completely done. The way you actually improve performance when you're in the bandwidth limited regime is to increase AI. To increase AI, the arithmetic intensity, you have to decrease the denominator. That is, you decrease the data movement. You decrease data movement by improving spatial locality. You increase da uh, decrease data movement by improving cache blocking. You choose alternate data structures or alternate data types that require less data. In any of those veins, you may actually reduce the data movement for that loop nest by reducing 
the data movement, you increase arithmetic intensity, that is you increase data reuse. And by increasing that data reuse, you're able to basically slide this dot along the bandwidth limited regime to higher performance. So, you know, I kind of alluded to this uh, early on, but you know, you end up with the kind of question, how can performance ever be below the roof line? How do you ever end up in that regime where your dot is not just right smack on the, the roof line performance bound? Well, there's a number of, of different ways. So first of all, we can have dots that are actually misplaced. That is, the kernel itself, you may have, uh, when doing your instrumentation activity, you may have calculated the number, wrong number of floating point operations, you may have calculated the wrong number of bytes. Uh, this can occur from a number of reasons. You can have broken hardware or software performance counters. You can make assumptions on how many flops are actually being performed based on an operation, or the way you calculate how many bytes are being moved may be off. Second, the lines may be misplaced. That is, you may look at a architectural manual and say, okay, here's the peak bandwidth of the machine and here's the peak flop rate of the machine. The problem is, is that that may be an overestimate. That may be the ideal assumption on what the roofline should look like for that target architecture. The way you really construct a roofline model is an empirical approach. That is, you actually have to benchmark the memory bandwidth of the machine and the peak flop rate of the machine. If you fail to do that, uh, depending on the architecture, you could be off by as much as 20%. Uh, those assumptions, though, also assume that you're perfectly load balanced. That is, if all the cores or all the SMs are all driving the memory subsystem at the same time, you get one bandwidth. If only one SM is driving the memory subsystem and the other 79 on a Volta are completely idle, you will never get peak bandwidth. You will never get peak flops of the machine. So you can actually think about how you might draw additional lines if you are heavily load imbalanced, or if alternately you're not generating enough thread blocks to fully occupy your GPU. Uh, the third way you can be below the roof line is there could be missing lines. That is, there could be bounds other than DRAM or flops. The original equation we did was based on an incredibly simplified model where we distilled down that incredibly complicated architecture into just compute and data movement. But the reality is, is we can back off on a few of those assumptions. We might assume that there is uh, insufficient cache bandwidth or cache locality, in which case cache bandwidth may become an impediment. We can as, uh, make assumptions about whether we properly use the fuse multiply add vector or tensor instructions or we may just have too many non-floating point instructions impeding our overall performance. So let's think about a few of those cases and how to actually rectify them. So first of all, let's think about the model or application instrumentation uh, issues causing us to be below the roof line. So as I mentioned, those theoretical performance specifications that you may get may be highly optimistic. The DRAM pin bandwidth, that is the number of bits times the frequency versus the sustained bandwidth could be quite different. You may on modern architectures, whether they be CPUs or GPUs, fall into a turbo mode uh, where you actually run at a higher frequency for a short burst of time, or you may be underclocked because you're thermally limited. In either case, that can affect your overall compute capability. And then there's the more subtle aspect of what happens when you have a really, really complicated loop nest and the compiler just gives up. You may say this should never happen. It should never happen, but the reality is it does. There are times where the compiler just balks at overly complicated code and generates poor quality code. So what we really need is an empirical, performance, uh, empirical approach to uh, performance data. That is, what we want to do is actually benchmark our target machines so that we actually characterize how many flops in or sorry, how many, uh, what the peak flop rate is of the machine and what the peak bandwidth is of the machine. By the same extension, we want an empirical approach to data application characterization. That is, we want to know how many flops were moved and how many bytes were moved, not on a theoretical basis, but on an empirical observation basis. So to answer the first question, uh, several years ago, LBL developed what was called the Empirical Roofline Toolkit. This is a way we characterize CPU or GPU accelerated machine. It gives us the peak flop rates of the machine and the bandwidth at each level of memory of the memory hierarchy. It was written with MPI plus OpenMP and CUDA. That allows us to run on multiple GPUs on a multi 
GPU accelerated node architecture. So we could run that on the Cori KNL machine. We get one set of data. We get a DRAM uh, roofline, but we can also use the same tool to construct an L2 roofline or an L1 roofline, knowing what the uh, bandwidth is of the target machine. By the same extension, we could actually run it on uh, Summit Dev. This was a few years ago. You get a DRAM roofline or an, what this says is an L1 roofline, but as an artifact, it's actually an L2 roofline for this target machine. In this case, what the ERT has actually done is it summed up the performance on four different GPUs to construct this model. So let's get now to the next question of theoretical versus empirical. Let's think about how we visualize this. Well, we may have this theoretical model. This is the quoted flop rate of, of, of a GPU or CPU and the quoted bandwidth of a GPU or CPU. If we actually go ahead and run ERT, we are almost invariably gonna get lower bandwidth. We will almost invariably get a lower flop rate. That means that our dot, even though it hasn't actually moved, is now closer to the nominal roofline limit. Second, we can think about how we actually go about uh, measuring the number of flops in our code. That is, our code might have things like divide instructions. Well, most instruction set architectures don't actually incorporate a divide instruction, but map a divide into a sequence of floating point instructions. That means the total number of instructions you're executing is higher, and thus your empirical flop rate is higher than what you might have calculated by simply looking at your loop nest and counting flops. That means that our empirical AI has actually increased and our empirical flop rate has increased, which means that although we didn't really move closer to the nominal roofline limit, we did move closer to the peak, uh, to the machine balance. And second, we can think about what happens when we include all the cache effects or all the, the data movement effects. That is, when we go to actually measure how much data we moved, we don't wanna just look at our loop nest and calculate flops or bytes. We wanna think about how many bytes were actually moved to and from the memory subsystem. In some cases, due to cache effects, this may be actually quite high, and we must might thus see a decrease in arithmetic intensity, which may actually make us very, very close to the nominal roof line. So in this particular case, just as a recap, uh, using the empirical, roofline toolkit or some other benchmarking technique lowers the model. It brings the roofline, the lines themselves, closer uh, to the application's characteristics, while similarly measuring the air application's actual data movement and actual flops gives us a true sense of how close it is to the real machine capabilities. So the next aspect of, of why we might be below the roofline is centers around the cache hierarchy. That is, we may have bottlenecks in the, the cache that are actually more constraining than DRAM. So if we think about our memory hierarchy, we have, in this case, CPU. We might have uh, registers in the CPU core itself. We have an L1, an L2, an L3, and, and DRAM uh, to where we have locality at each of these levels. This means that we have an associated bandwidth at each of these levels. We also have an associated machine balance at each of these levels. That is, for each of those levels, we have the peak flops of the machine divided by the peak bandwidth at that particular level. By corollary, we still also have uh, an associated data movement for each of our applications or for each of our loop nests at each of these levels. That is, a given loop nest will have a unique number of L1 bytes, L2 bytes, L3 bytes, and DRAM bytes. That means that a given loop nest also has a unique arithmetic intensity for each level of the memory hierarchy. That is, you have for your uh, loop nest, you have an L1 intensity, an L2 intensity, L3, and DRAM intensity. That means that we can think about how we might extend our nominal reply model. That is, if we think back to our original equation, we might define AI with a subscript based on which level it is. We could then add an additional level. So this basically says our attainable flop rate is going to be the minimum of the peak flops of the machine or the product of AI and DRAM bandwidth or the product of L2 AI and L2 bandwidth. And thus we can just keep adding terms to this equation, basically defining more and more bounds on performance. How do we go about uh, visualizing this? Well, we could think about having a figure where we try to visualize 
uh, 15 different bounds on 15 different figures, but we actually, it's actually much, much easier to actually all plot them on a single figure. So in this particular case, we have what is called a hierarchical roofline model. So we start out with our original roofline, which has the HBM bound and the peak flop bound, but we can also add an additional bound based on the L2 cache bandwidth. Associated with the L2 is a uh, uh, L2 intensity for our given application. So for our application, for our loop nest, remember, these two dots are exactly the same loop nest. It just happens that this one is the AI for the L2. This one uses the AI for DRAM. The thing is, is that we can never have two different performance numbers for a given loop nest. That means that what we will actually observe is for a given loop nest, they will always have the same Y coordinate, but they will have different X coordinates. That is, you have an X coordinate for your L2 intensity and an X coordinate for your HBM intensity. In this particular case, what we observe, because we are uh, uh, bound by L2 bandwidth, we will see that the DRAM intensity, the DRAM performance, is well below the DRAM bandwidth of the associated machine. Uh, we could also imagine a, a similar case uh, where we have, have reversed things and we actually have much higher L2 locality. Now, there are a few things to actually observe when we actually uh, use the hierarchical roofline model. When you see the X coordinates of your loop nests, uh, AI, that is, if L2 AI is very, very different than DRAM AI, that says that you actually have very, very high reuse in the L2 cache. So in this particular example, we are moving orders of magnitude more bytes uh, to and from the L2 than we do from DRAM. That says that we're getting really, really good cache locality in the L2, and only a few bytes actually have to, to trickle out all the way to DRAM. Conversely, we could imagine running a different uh, loop nest where we actually have no reuse. That is, every time we move a byte to and from the L2, we end up moving a byte to and from DRAM. That basically says that the L2 is doing nothing for us. It's not doing any kind of bandwidth filtering. It's not doing any latency filtering. And all we're doing is streaming data uh, through the L2. So when those when the AIs are widely separated, we have high reuse. When they are very, very close together, we have no reuse. Uh, having no reuse is not necessarily a good thing because it says that you're not really making good use of that inherent cache architecture that's in every CPU and GPU. You really wanna be in that scenario where those AIs are widely separated. So the third aspect of why we might be below the roofline centers around uh, end core effects. This is really geared towards the instruction set. Are we using fuse multiply add, vectorization, tensor cores? So vectors by themselves have their limits. That is, a vector uh, has a finite, uh, applications have a finite amount of data level parallelism. Uh, when you use a vector machine, the register file energy basically scales with the vector length. Uh, there are a number of other constraints that say vectors eventually taper out in terms of their performance. Uh, the death of Moore's law is really reinvigorating some facets of complex instruction set computing. You're not going to get back to the, the kind of complicated uh, load architectures where you're mixing loads and compute. I think the, the uh, load store architectures are here to stay, but what you will get are very, very complicated compute instructions. So this started out by having fuse multiply add instructions where you have a single instruction that takes two uh, values, uh, multiplies one of them, and then adds it to the second one, storing it into a third. Uh, that can be extended, obviously, into a vector version. Uh, you can then go from that version into what is called quad FMA that occurred in the uh, uh, x86 uh, instruction sets. These are basically matrix vector multiplications in a single instruction. And then on GPUs, you have tensor uh, core instructions where you might have uh, multiplication by uh, of two small matrices adding to a third matrix. In all of these cases, these are a, a single instruction or could be a, a limited number of instructions that do a large, large number of operations. But this means that instructions are now going to be, the instructions in an application are really a mix of scalar instructions, which could be predicated on a vector machine, 
uh, vector instructions, matrix operations, and that means that performance is now going to be a weighted average of all of these different types of instructions. That is, a scalar instruction might only do uh, one floating point operation. A vector instruction might do 32 operations. A tensor instruction might do uh, 128 uh, floating point operations. You have to add all of those up to understand whether you're getting good performance. So if we consider something like a, a voltage GPU, we have ballpark 100 teraflops of FP16 uh, tensor performance. We have something like uh, only 15 teraflops of FP32 performance. And if we get rid of FMA, we only have something in the seven and a half teraflops of uh, FP32 add performance. Any kind of deep learning application will be a mix of tensor operations, FP16 operations, and FP32 operations. Uh, that means that your deep learning uh, performance may be well below the nominal tensor core peak because it's having to average together instructions that are FP32 adds, FP32 FMAs, and FP16 WMAs. In essence, the mix of the actual instructions imposes an effective ceiling on performance. And the real question then becomes, how close are you to that effective ceiling on performance? The uh, fourth aspect is FPU starvation. That is, we have assumed to date that the FPU, we can, it's just a question of how fast we can give instructions to the FPU, and that's our, gonna be our limiting factor modulo uh, data locality. But the reality is, is that processors have finite instruction decode fetch issue uh, bandwidth, which means that the number of floating point is units, the number of FPUs, dictates the FPU rate required to actually hit that peak uh, performance number. The ratio of those two is the ratio of floating point instructions required to actually hit that peak performance number. So let's consider an example. Let's say we have some four, uh, four issue superscalar CPU with two floating point data paths. That means at least 50% of our instructions have to be floating point to have any chance of getting peak performance. If we have only 25% uh, of floating point and let's say 75% integer, our performance will can never exceed 50% of peak and it falls progressively from them. So if we have applications that are dominated by integer instructions, we have to really take this into account because we are not gonna be uh, uh, compute limited for those uh, classes of applications. In the worst case, we might have an architecture that has two floating point uh, data paths, but is only two-way superscalar. In that particular case, you might need 100% of your instructions to the floating point to have any chance of getting peak performance, which is basically never going to happen. If you're in that regime and you have only 25% of your instructions being floating point, you're going to be getting a very, very low fraction of peak performance, even if you are well past the machine balance. So this gives rise to a different version of roofline, which is how do we think about roofline not geared around floating point operations, but geared around instructions. In this case, this is the instruction roofline model. Uh, I have the reference here to the paper that we did last year. So how do we go beyond uh, the flop centered roofline? That is when your application has, uh, uh, we, we could think about how we might classify applications. We have those heavy floating point applications that's actually kind of rare within DOE. Uh, we have applications that are a mix of integer and floating point operations that, that's more common. Uh, but then we have these emerging classes of applications from bioinformatics or graph uh, algorithms where they may be integer only computations. That is, they have no floating point operations. If you have no floating point operations, your arithmetic intensity is zero, and you can never even plot a zero arithmetic intensity on a log log roofline model. The other aspect is a different way of dealing with mixed precision codes, where rather than thinking about how you do a weighted average of flops, you think about how many instructions you're executing. So I will note that one way that Intel Advisor did, dealt with this is they went from just doing floating point operations per second to integer operations or flops plus integer operations per second, which is useful when you wanna understand uh, performance as uh, operations per second rather than bottlenecks in the machine of instructions per second. 
So what we really wanted at that point was a instruction roofline model, not an integer operation roofline model. So the most basic way of doing this this is on a SIMD machine, you might consider vector microops instead of flops. The vector microops can be easily mapped to any kind of vector unit utilization. 100% uh, utilization basically can bottleneck performance. Uh, the other advantage is, is that when we deal on CPUs, most of our performance counters don't give us flops, but they actually give us vector microops, which makes it an easier transition to constructing a roofline model. The thing to keep in mind is just because you have Full utilization of your vector unit does not imply full peak performance because peak performance assumes that you did FMA, you did vector operations, you did tensor operations. Well, vector unit utilization just says the vector units are busy all the time. They could be busy doing inefficient instructions. So in this particular case, you know, we might start out with the traditional roofline model, which has uh, bandwidth and flops. Uh, we have a nominal arithmetic intensity associated with it uh, and a performance well below that number. We can think about moving to a vector microop version. We might have the same bandwidth, but now we have a peak vector microops per second rather than peak flops per second. This is basically taking how many operations are in an instruction and dividing out. This means we have a potentially different uh, machine balance. We have a potentially different uh, AI associated with the number of instructions or the number of micro ops that we're actually executing. When we actually look at that version of roofline, we may actually get, be getting a very, very high fraction of roofline of the micro op roofline rather than the nominal uh, flop roofline. So the question then becomes, how do we take this kind of formulation and apply it to an NVIDIA GPU? Well, we might not have uh, vector microops. Uh, we probably have warp instructions instead. Uh, but then the question becomes, do we want to do instructions per byte or something else? And this gets into the question of what's an instruction on the GPU. If you do the more thread-centric version, well, then you hide some of the issue limits. If you do the more warp-centric version, then you hide some of the predication effects. And the solution was basically to scale the number of non-predicated threads warp size, i.e. divide by 32, and show it in terms of warp instructions per second. You can, of course, then break this down into subclasses, integer, FP32, load store, whatever, to understand bottlenecks in individual functional units rather than bottlenecks at the instruction issue, the warp issue rate. So naively, one might think you ought to use bytes. And that would match the existing roofline quite well when thinking about intensity. That is, if we did instructions per byte, that's our, our uh, direct uh, translation from our original flops per byte. But the reality is GPUs access memory using transactions. And those transactions might be 32 bytes for global local memory. They might be 128 bytes for shared memory. Uh, so we ended up uh, deciding to use instructions for transaction as the means of understanding both machine balance and application intensity. This preserves the kind of traditional concepts of the roofline model, but it actually ended up allowing us to think of new ways of understanding memory access. So this means that if we start out with our original flop-centric roofline, if we have integer heavy codes, we want to actually transform this. We think of it as uh, giga instructions per second with some kind of instruction intensity rather than arithmetic intensity. And then we can modify that to be both warp instructions and think about how we would map this if we actually dealt with transactions instead of bytes. This means that for the instruction roofline model, we have the peak instruction rate of the machine. We have in instruction intensity in terms of uh, warp instructions per transaction, and then we have uh, DRAM bandwidth measured in not in bytes per second, but in transactions per second. We can then uh, basically plot this uh, for roof line, for a uh, voltage GPU. We get these numbers. It's just a different way of, of trying to analyze application performance. But what it really allowed us to do is think about how we think about global memory access differently. So rather than thinking of total instruction 
transaction intensity, total number of instructions divided by total transactions. If we think specifically about load store instructions divided by uh, global transactions, we have a very special meaning. In this particular case, this allows us to understand the efficiency of global memory access. We actually can observe that there are three very important intensities, load store instructions divided by global transactions, basically mapping to what our memory access pattern is like. If we're doing fully random access, where every thread in a warp is just accessing a random location in memory, we're we're basically doing the same thing as if we were striding by greater than 128 bytes. That's the minimum intensity we can ever have for load store intensity. Uh, conversely, if all the threads in a warp access exactly the same memory location, the sing only a single transaction is required, and thus we can have a very, very high intensity of uh, one instruction per transaction. Somewhere in between, we have the unit stride memory access pattern where uh, our warp just walks through memory sequentially. The threads in a warp uh, access uh, consecutive memory elements. Why is this important? Well, we can think about those walls as constraining performance. Uh, we have the unattainably low to the left and the unattainably high to the right. And if we actually pop plot our applications intensity, we may actually see that our applications are actually accessing memory and uh, global memory inefficiently. That is, uh, out of the box, our application may be accessing memory close to a random access pattern. Through some optimization efforts, we really want to think about how we can transform that intensity to improve it to get it close to the unit stride intensity. We can do the same exercise in shared memory and think about how that, that same kind of uh, concept, shared load store instructions divided by shared transactions, allows us to quantify the number of bank conflicts that are actually occurring. That is, if all the threads in a warp access all the same bank in shared memory, you're going to get a 32-way bank conflict and, and you're gonna generate 32 transactions. That's really low performance. Uh, conversely, if uh, all the threads in a warp access a different location in memory, a uh, different bank in, in shared memory, you'll only generate uh, the one transaction and you'll get a uh, uh, high shared load store intensity. So at the same way, we can think about plotting our application's intensity. We can think about how optimization may improve intensity. So if we look at a Smith-Waterman type example, we may actually observe in the naive implementation, uh, we actually get kind of moderate uh, uh, instruction throughput. If we think about what the actual load store, global load store efficiency is, we actually see that it's actually rather poor. That is, we're doing almost random access in the naive implementation. And conversely, we may have no bank conflicts. Uh, the optimized implementation may, may do uh, memory coalescing. This allows us to move from a strided memory access to a unit stride memory access and thereby get better performance. Once again, the number of uh, bank conflicts didn't really change. So the major takeaway is, is that that kind of transformation allowed us to change gather scatter into unit stride and get near peak instruction throughput. I'm going to skip over the example for uh, matrix transpose and move on. Um, for the instruction roof line, the traditional roof line is really about telling us about performance. Uh, the kind of use of FMA SIMD vectors really has no effect on intensity, but it can increase performance. What the instruction roof line does is it tells us about bottlenecks, whether those bottlenecks be in the issue rate or in memory. Uh, we can use uh, the any kind of use of FMA SIMD or vector actually decreases in intensity and may actually decrease in performance. Any kind of uh, integer instructions may actually increase instruction intensity and increase instruction throughput. And then finally, the memory rolls really tell us about the efficiency of memory access. When you're on the far left of one of those memory walls, you're doing basically random access. If you're on the far right or in the midpoint, you're actually getting very good memory efficiency. Um, one of the other ways you can be below the roof line is you are underutilizing the parallelism of the machine. 
So if we think about uh, running uh, traditional thread scaling experiments on a CPU, we may, for different problem sizes, scale up the number of threads and observe the differences in flop rates. Uh, remember, this is a log-log scale, so we can actually see, whereas the blue uh, problem size saturates in performance, the green problem size actually falls over in performance. The problem is, is that this kind of formulation, this kind of way of thinking about thread scalability doesn't really tell us anything about what went wrong. Why did the green problem size actually see a turnover in performance and see lower performance as we increase the number of threads? So one of the things Khaled Ibrahim did was to actually take roofline and use it to understand uh, process or thread scalability. That is basically you're doing a 2D scatter plot, a trend line function uh, to understand how performance and arithmetic intensity changes with thread concurrency. So whereas the blue line in this case may actually see uh, uh, substantial increases in performance all, uh, through every different concurrency between 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 64 threads, uh, what we actually observe is it's actually losing uh, arithmetic intensity. That is, the arithmetic intensity is starting to, uh, to wane. Conversely, the green and red problem sizes see ideal uh, scaling, that is, for a range, they maintain constant arithmetic intensity, but eventually they blow out the cache and performance begins to degrade. That is, you're getting more data movement in the bandwidth limited regime, which means you fall down the wrong direction along the bandwidth diagonal. This can also be applied to other NAS benchmarks. It can be used to understand the difference between OpenACC and CUDA. And I will point people to this paper from Bench uh, from last year, which actually won a best paper for understanding the differences between these different uh, programming models on different uh, NAS parallel benchmarks. So to provide a recap, what Roofline is really doing is it's bounding performance as a function of arithmetic intensity. That is, Roofline itself has those horizontal lines. Those are the compute ceilings. It has the diagonal lines. Those are the bandwidth ceilings. The almost invariably, we will always plot these on a log log scale because it makes it very easy to understand. And collectively, these ceilings, these lines, define an upper limit on performance. You have arithmetic intensity, which is going to be unique for each loop nest, it is unique for each level of memory, and it is that measure of data locality, the measure of temporal locality. It is the ratio of the total number of flops that your loop nest performs divided by the total bytes uh, your loop nest actually uh, moves. When we plot on the roof line, every loop has one dot per level of, mem of the memory hierarchy. So if you have 10 major loops and four levels of memory hierarchy, you have 40 dots that you might have to, to plot. More than likely, you'll only plot a subset of those at a time. You might plot only the DRAM ones at a time. You might plot all of the uh, four levels for a single loop nest at one time. That cuts down on how much data you're actually having to visualize. When one of those dots is close to the ceiling, that indicates you are likely uh, seeing a performance bound. The Re position of those dots relative to each other within a loop nest is indicative of the cache locality. That is, remember, if you're, for a given loop nest, if your four dots for L1, L2, L3, and DRAM are widely separated, that means you're getting great cache locality. If they're all bunched together, that basically means you're streaming data through cache. All of these concepts apply equally to any kind of GPU or other accelerator. So. What do we use Roofline for? Well, there's the obvious thing of using it to understand the differences between architectures, programming models, and implementations. That is, why do some architectures or implementations perform better than others? Why do some compilers perform better than others? But it's also useful for understanding and predicting the performance on future machines. That is, this allows us to set realistic performance expectations and focus on where we actually need to drive a few future architectures. That is, in some cases, we want more bandwidth. We may want more compute for other applications, or we want, may want better instruction issue rates for other applications without increasing flops or bytes. It's also, of course, useful for understanding performance bottlenecks and trying to motivate software optimization. But finally, it's really good for determining when we're done optimizing code. When you are close to that roofline limit, 
uh, you really need to think about how you make algorithmic changes to move forward because you're really not going to make uh, substantial increases in performance when you're already within 90% of the roofline limit. At the same time, you can imagine taking your performance today, your performance a month from now, your performance three months from now, and plotting it all on the same roofline figure. You can see a resultant trajectory and see how you're actually approaching the roofline limit. I will say that the model itself is just one piece of the puzzle. It defines the basic concepts and the basic equations. But uh, at the same time, you have to have system characterization that really defines where the lines are, where the dots are. Uh, you have the application characterization to define the dots, and then you have some kind of visualization and analysis tool. Uh, in the remainder of this tutorial, uh, Charlene will demonstrate how to construct the roofline model on NVIDIA GPUs that'll focus really on system characterization and application characterization. Uh, Max will dem demonstrate how to use Insight Compute to automate the roofline collection. This includes uh, the GPU benchmarking, the application characterization, and integrated visualization. And then you will go ahead and use Insight Compute to analyze your own individual applications. At that point, I am at the top of the hour and I will take questions. Thanks, Sam. So I think we have a question from the chat. Um, uh, the question is, why is the bandwidth bound boundary not intercepting the origin? So it does intercept the origin. The thing to remember is that because it's on a log-log scale, you can never actually plot the origin. You'll never be able to see the origin, the zero-zero coordinate on a log-log scale. Yep. I think it takes a minute to realize that, but uh, you know, a lot of people would probably wonder about that uh, when they started uh, when they started doing uh, reply analysis. Yep. It's a good point. It, it, it is a subtle point that we probably should add a slide to to help explain in the future. Yep. So I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, okay, I'll be on the Slack channel if people have questions or, or want them to, uh, to ask. Sure, okay. Uh, yeah, I just had one question. The, the roofline model you presented here for the GPU, is it uh, all uh, inside uh, Insight now or is it a different version in Insight? Uh, Insight will, will always uh, probably implement a subset of what, it is, what has been done. Remember there is the kind of research activities which are kind of the bleeding edge. You know, they, they go ahead and then think about new ideas, think about new concepts. Uh, some of those pan out, some of them may not pan out, some of of them are broadly applicable, some of them are more niche. Um, uh, Insight itself will take most likely a subset of those and incorporate them in. Okay. So we have two more questions on the chat. Maybe you can take a look. I think we're a bit behind. I'm not sure what, what the K minus one is referring to. So, the, uh, hi, uh, this is Neil. Uh, there was an example where uh, you added new K -I, uh, KJI uh, with uh, the old KJI. Yeah, this one. Yes, okay. Uh, and the, and um, in the denominator, it was just 8 bytes for the uh, new and 8 bytes for the old K plus 1. Right. But there's also K minus 1. Um, is, is it because the K minus 1 already is uh, present on the uh, cache? That's right. So on uh, the loop iteration, uh, you know, if we're on loop, loop iteration k, then on loop iteration k minus one, we already pulled that in. Okay. Got it. Or loop iteration k minus two. Which any of those, the previous loop iterations have already pulled in that data. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So. Can you stop sharing? Uh, sure, I was gonna uh, answer the one more question. I think that was in the uh, chat window. Um, so you can always uh, construct a operation-centered roofline which takes together both integer operations and floating point operations, or you can do that in mixed precision. Uh, nominally though, 
uh, when we think about instruction roof line versus flop roof line, those tend to be separate concepts. We can think about floating point instructions per second or total instructions per second, or we can think about floating point operations per second. Okay, thanks. Uh, we can we can have more discussions later on Slack or here. Um, so you guys can see my screen, right? Um, so after the you know the the theory talk, I would like to. Uh, kind of go through the the practical mechanism um, as to how to collect roofline data. And uh, today we're really just focused on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, but like uh, Sam said, um, the general methodology, the roofline model, uh, works for all architectures. You just need to find you know the uh, the proper metrics, the proper tools to to collect uh, the relevant data. So um, the goal um, here uh, is to uh, plot a roofline like this. Uh, you have probably multiple uh, memory levels on, on the architecture and uh, different uh, data precisions, different instruction types. Um, you may be executing on um, the, the CUDA core. You may be using tensor cores as well. Um, but Essentially, we want to have a you know a very complex um, roof line like this. Um, having said that, uh, you know if if you know uh, that your code is not using, um, say the tensor core, you don't have to you know plot this roof line uh, here, uh, this one. Um, so you may be just looking at you know the other precisions or the other. Um, operations on the CUDA core. Um, but uh, today we would like to provide a uh, methodology uh, for how to collect all um, this data. So um, there are three steps. Um, well, first, we need to find out uh, what the roofline peaks are, the ceilings. And um, to get those numbers, we could uh, just look up, you know, the, the white paper from, um, from the vendors and uh, use the theoretical values uh, for, you know, the uh, peak bandwidth or the peak flops. Um, we, at NERSC, at, at LBL, um, uh, we have um, developed also a tool to, uh, empirically measure the the peaks, and um, so if you go to this link here, you would find this toolkit. Uh, and this tool um, essentially uh, sweeps through a range of configurations and runs a few micro kernels. Um, it, the purpose of it is really to stress test um, the the peak bandwidth, the peak flops um, and those micro kernels are really finely tuned and if those kernels cannot uh, get say you know the, the peaks that we see from the white paper then um, you know we uh, really have to consider what the, the actual um, runtime environment is maybe you know the power is uh, being a constraint or you know some other things uh, being uh, a constraint to um, to the peak, um, but but by doing this, uh, we do get a more realistic um, uh, understanding of um, what uh, the peaks can be. Because if if those microkernels cannot uh, reach um, the advertised peaks, then uh, we we cannot uh, expect that you know large scale HPC applications do. Um, so that's that's the whole purpose of this um, empirical roofline toolkit. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this uh, in a moment. 
but um, the first step is to you know, get the ceilings. And then uh, we need to uh, measure the, uh, basically the application data uh, to put the dots on the roof line. And those dots have uh, two coordinates. Uh, the X coordinate is the arithmetic intensity. And to calculate this, we need to measure the, the flops, which is the total number of floating point operations. Um, carried out in, in the kernel, um, and then the data movement, so how many bytes uh, have been moved um, for a particular memory level. Uh, so the ratio of these two would be the arithmetic intensity. And the Y coordinate is the, the throughput, um, so flops per second, um, and for that we need to uh, get the runtime uh, for the kernel. So uh, basically three uh, quantities we have to measure. Uh, and uh, I guess here I have to say that for data movement, uh, this number of bytes could be for different um, cache levels. So uh, if you're looking at a hierarchical uh, roof line, then uh, you need to measure more than three um, quantities. Um, but the method of uh, you know calculating the arithmetic intensity and the performance uh, is the same. So um, after getting all these um, numbers, uh, we we need to plot them up. Um, the the more uh, automatic way of doing this is to uh, use inside compute, uh, and we have. Uh, a few section files uh, you can use to um, to plot the roof line, um, but also you know uh, the section files uh, can collect uh, these quantities as well. So um, the whole workflow is automatic. Um, but if uh, you'd like to kind of customize the um, uh, the plots a little bit, um, you could try the scripts we have here uh, in this repository. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give you a bit more details uh, about this in a moment. So, so the first step, um, uh, you know, we could use the theoretical numbers or we could use the empirical roofline toolkit to get a, uh, a more real, realistic set of peaks. Uh, and so this plot here uh, shows um, how ERT works. Uh, so basically, it sweeps uh, through a range of um, uh, data sets um, and uh, it measures the, uh, the bandwidth um, for each working set, uh, also the flops, and uh, depending on how compute intensive uh, the kernel you're using um, is, um, you could be you know, getting the peak uh, bandwidth or the peak uh, flops. Uh, so um, if you run ERT, you, you will get a few plots like this. And uh, for these plateaus, um, uh, you will see that, you know, for, the, for this particular graph, um, you, you are actually looking at different uh, peak bandwidths, uh, say for HBM, for L2, L1. Um, and for this plot, uh, you're looking at uh, the peak flops. So uh, then how do we uh, collect um, the application data? Um, the, the manual way of doing this is to, you know, uh, use uh, inside compute. Um, to collect these metrics yourself. Um, I have listed the metrics here, uh, also the scripts we have uh, in this repository uh, use um, exactly the same metrics as well. Um, so um, you, can, you can also you know, uh, integrate this into your, your own workflow. Um, and this should uh, produce exactly the same results as um, inside compute. Um, 
So maybe jumping to this um, slide first. Um, so the metrics uh, being used in inside compute are a bit different than um, the metrics in the table that I have just shown. Um, but um, uh, the <clears throat> uh, the the actual uh, flops, the actual um, arithmetic intensity should come out the same. Uh, it's just the way that you know we calculate, um, we, we combine different metrics is a bit different, um, but um, in the end they should uh, be exactly the same. Um, so. So I have to say uh, this uh, set of metrics come from um, Inside Compute uh, from CUDA 11. Um, we used to have a, a set of metrics uh, from NVPROF um, because um, NVPROF is kind of phasing out, uh, being replaced by um, Inside Compute, Inside Systems. Uh, we would recommend you to really try the new set of uh, metrics. Um, the, uh, I think previously we have also published uh, a set of metrics from CUDA 10, uh, also using Inside Compute, um, but this is uh, slightly, slightly different uh, than what we have now. And uh, uh, if you're using, if you have access to CUDA 11, uh, we would really you know, recommend you to try the new uh, metrics, um, but these metrics should be equivalent to each other. All right, so um, coming to the last part, which is, uh, you know, to actually plot uh, the refine charts. Um, if you use uh, Inside Compute, uh, you would automatically uh, get a refine chart like this. Um, uh, one thing I, I didn't notice at the beginning uh, is that, uh, you know, the, uh, the roofline chart is one per one, uh, one chart per kernel. Uh, so if you don't see, you know, the relevant kernel uh, on your chart, you might want to go to this drop down a button to see, you know, what other kernels you have profiled. Um, of course, you can, uh, you know, just profile the kernel you wanted. But uh, it's just, you know, something um, you may not notice uh, at first glance. Um, if you use the scripts here, we have, um, you know, um, kind of put all the dots on the same chart. Um, for example, in here, um, you see different um, colors for different kernels and then different uh, markers for different um, cache levels. Um, but these, these scripts are really for uh, the example we have in, in the repository, which is the GPP uh, kernel. Uh, if you know, you're running um, uh, your own code and they have different uh, settings, say different uh, amount of kernels, different amount of uh, um, um, indications or uh, the range of the, the uh, throughput changes, then you really have to tweak um, the scripts we have uh, to, to fit your needs. So to quickly show a few examples um, of um, the hierarchical roofline uh, charts we have, um, if you use Inside Compute, um, uh, this is uh, a very um, kind of typical <clears throat> gem example using tensor cores. Uh, we have five uh, different kernels in, in this code and using inside compute, uh, you can see all the kernels have been uh, profiled. Um, I believe these are, you know, just two different implications uh, of the same kernel. Um, but, uh, you can see that we have three different dots uh, representing the, uh, the performance uh, for different uh, cache levels, so L1, L2, and uh, HBM. Um, the, um, if you go to, say, the first two or three um, kernels, you will not see any dots because those dots um, 
those kernels have uh, no flops, so there's no floating point operations um, in those kernels, and in that case, you wouldn't see anything on the on the roof line. Um, it the same happens here with um, the scripts we have. Uh, so uh, here you would see uh, three different kernels um, showing up on the on the roof line, and um, um, the the first two, which is you know just converting um, between different uh, data formats, and that wouldn't have any you know flops, and then generating uh, Cs, and that also doesn't have um, any flops. Um, so we have these three kernels here, and um, uh, three different markers for each kernel. Um, with with the scripts, we can customize, you know, the, the names we want to put on the plot. Uh, we can change the range of the x axis or the y axis. Um, we also, you know, uh, choose to plot or not plot uh, some of the kernels. So um, on that, in that sense, it's more uh, flexible than than using inside compute. Um, but it's really, you know, up to you. Um, so another example of using the scripts to plot uh, roofline. Um, here you can separate uh, the HBM L2 L1 um, performance uh, from each other. So for this one, you're just plotting um, the HBM data. This one is just L2 and L1. You can also change the size of the markers. Uh, to be uh, based on the the amount of time spent uh, in that kernel or the the number of um, kernel calls uh, for that particular kernel. Uh, so this is based on the kernel count. Uh, this is based on the flops um, uh, performed in that kernel. Uh, so all these um, uh, plots uh, have um, see, all these dots are below the single precision peak, uh, which is about 14, um, 15 teraflops. And uh, when you have a different setting for the code, you know, uh, we can have, you know, tensor core um, kernels as well. Uh, so, um, so, so there's, these scripts can be really customized to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, satisfy all your plotting needs, um, but you just need to do a bit of work. Um, the the scripts we have in in the repository are really the basic, um, the most basic ones. Uh, and of course, you can you know plot um, the the whole optimization path. Uh, so you know, step one we have. Um, the performance here and step two, and as we optimize the, the kernel further, we, we're seeing performance going up and up, um, arithmetic intensity also changing um, uh, between different steps. Uh, so uh, it really depends on how you want to visualize the, the data. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the mechanism behind uh, the roofline data collection, uh, especially on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and uh, I had collected a few questions um, before this uh, event. Um, and if you have more, you can um, put your questions or, uh, you know, if you have found bugs or anything like that uh, in the, the Google Doc and we can uh, discuss this uh, later in the, in the hackathon uh, this afternoon. So with that, I'd like to stop. Uh, is there any questions? Okay. Um, uh, Charlene, there is a question in the chat. Yeah. 
So the slides will be ready. Uh, I have posted mine and Sam's. I think Max will have some too. Um, right, so all of them should be available after the event. Um, and then I see three other questions. How to embed our workload into these scripts? Um, I think we'll get into more details about this, um, but I can quickly uh, go through some of the readme we have. Um, so let me share my screen. So this is the repository I'm talking about. Um, we have uh, this GPP code. Um, this is the input file for the GPP code. And uh, we have two job scripts. Um, one is using inside compute. So using this, you can collect uh, the profile, um, the profiles, uh, which can be opened uh, using the inside compute GUI. Um, the the other script uh, run dot customized uh, is uh, using the metrics I mentioned, and it is you know the more customized way of um, collecting metrics. Um, this is using the command line of inside compute. Uh, you won't get a, uh, a um, kind of a visual um, profile, um, and to embed your workload into these scripts. I guess you just have to, you know, um, leave um, all the metrics there and kind of change the, you know, the kernels you want to profile and the code uh, you want to run. Um, so for example here, you want to change that uh, to your own code. Uh, same for the, for the other script. Um, so this, um, this script and, and the other one, um, they both run through the GPP example uh, five times. So we have the baseline version and then four optimized versions. Um, so Max will, get, will, will talk about this after the break and uh, I think you'll get more details there. Um, second question, is there any DJAM application? Uh, in in the GPP code or just anywhere? Um, maybe what I can do is uh, run through. So we have some DGEM. Well, we have some GEM uh, examples, at least from the CUDA examples. So okay. I can um, do that when I talk a little bit later. I can show how to use uh, roofline analysis for that. That would help, be helpful. Okay. Uh, that's great. Yeah, that was my question. Sorry, okay. it was incomplete. Yeah, thank yep. you. Okay. And does NUSCA have license to use access app? Um, oh, the spec? Um, I believe so. Um, so are you trying to profile these kernels, these benchmarks? Uh, yeah, so I think like that's my, uh, yeah, I will be trying some of them. So I wonder like if uh, we have, I think they require some sort of license. So I wonder like if, we can get like right. if the NERSC or the NVIDIA has the license for that one or? Yeah. I think I think we do. Um, I know you work with uh, Sridhar, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me check with him. Um, he should know. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Cool. Um, any other questions? Max, do you see anything on the Slack channel? Is anybody asking anything? Uh, there was one question, but Sam answered it. Um, okay. It was a good question, though. Um. Okay. Um, then I guess um, we're due for a break. Um, we'll be back in 15 minutes, and uh, Max will be, uh, you know, talking about the examples that he just said. All right. See you guys in a bit.